Chapter Thirty Nine of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter Thirty Nine. The Promised Epistle. Under any circumstances, a return to Swampville would have been necessary. Certain pecuniary requirements called me back to that interesting village a journey even across the desert cannot be made without money and the hundred dollars i had paid to holt with hotel and other incidental outlays had left me with a very light purse it would have taken three times as much as i was master of to provide us with the scantiest equipment required for a prairie journey and toward this the young hunter willing to give his all was able to contribute nothing he would cheerfully have parted with his patrimony as i with my purchase for a very slender consideration but at that crisis the californian speculation demanded all the specie in circulation and neither his clearing nor mine would have sold for a single dollar had the payment been required in cash a credit sale could not have served us in any way and we were forced to hold on to our depreciated property upon which not a single cent could be borrowed never stood i in more need of my nashville friend and my appeal already made was promptly responded to as i expected it would be on the third day after my dispatch the answer arrived with a handsome enclosure enough to carry us across the continent and back again if need be we were now ready for the road we waited only for that other letter that was to be the index of our destination how we passed our time during that interval of expectation is not worth describing we enjoyed the hospitality of the jackson hotel and contrived to escape the espiglieri of the husband-hunting denizens by hunting the deer of the surrounding forest during the whole time we went not near our respective plantations on mud creek wingrove had good reason for being shy of that quarter and i had no inclination to trust myself to its souvenirs moreover the hours of the mail rider were neither fixed nor regular and on this account i avoided a prolonged absence from the post office six days of this expectancy i endured six days of alternate hope and doubt the latter at times so distressing that even in the excitement of the chase i could not procure distraction for my thoughts more than once my comrade and i had almost ceased to hope and half resolved to launch ourselves on the great prairie ocean trusting to chance to guide us to the haven of our hopes on the sixth day we had determined upon it and only awaited the mail that should arrive on the morning of the seventh the seventh proved the day of joy our doubts were dispelled the cloud that hung over our course was cleared away by the arrival of the expected epistle my fingers trembled as i took the precious billet from the hands of the postmaster he must have observed my emotion though i did not open the letter in his presence the superscription was enough to tell me from whom it came i had studied the facsimile of that pretty cipher till it was well impressed upon my memory and could therefore recognize it at a glance i did not even break open the envelope till we were upon the road the postmark van buren arkansas sufficiently indicated the direction we were to take and not till we had cleared the skirts of swampville and were en route for memphis did i enter upon the pleasure of perusal the address was simply as before to edward warfield and so to the apostrophic commencement stranger i could have wished for some less distant word some familiar phrase of endearment but i was contented for i knew that lillian's too recent love had lacked the opportunity of learning its language before it had time to achieve the employment of those sweet forms of speech its course had been rudely interrupted thus ran the letter stranger i hope you got my other letter and that you were able to read it for i had no paper nor pens nor ink to write it better only a little bit of a pencil that was my mother's and a leaf which father said you tore out of a book but i think i could have wrote it better only i was so afraid that they would see me and scold me for it and i wrote it in a great hurry when they were from home and then left it on the table after both of them had gone down to the creek to get into the canoe i thought no one would come to the house before you and i hoped all the morning you might come before we were gone i would have given a great deal to have been able to see you again and i think father would have waited till you came only his friend would not let him stay longer but hurried us away but i hope you got the letter and that you will not be offended at me for writing this one i send you without your leave 
i promise that if you will allow me i would write from some place and tell you the name of the country where we are going but i forgot that it would be impossible for you to give me leave as you could not see me nor yet know where to write it to me i know now what country it is for everybody we have seen is talking about it and saying that it is full of gold that lies on the ground in pieces as big as hickory nuts and i hear the name a many a time over and over again father calls it california some call california and this i suppose is the right way of spelling it it is near a great sea or ocean as they call it which is not the same that comes in at philadelphia and new york but far greater and bigger than the mississippi and the obion and all the rivers put together it must be a very large sea to be bigger than the mississippi but i am sure you must know all about it for i have heard them say you have travelled in these far-away countries and that you were an officer in the army and had been fighting there with the mexicans i am glad you were not killed and got safe home again to tennessee for if you had been killed i should never have seen you but now it is just as bad if i am never to see you again oh sir i would write to you from that country when we are settled there but i fear you will forget me before then and will not care to hear anything more about us i shall never forget our dear tennessee i am very sorry at leaving it and i am sure i can never be happy in california with all its gold for what good can gold be to me i should so like to hear sometimes from our old home but father has no friends who could write us the only one we knew has gone away like ourselves maybe sir you would not mind writing to us only a very short letter to tell us how you get on with the clearing and whether you have made it much bigger and built a great house upon it as i have heard father say you intended to do i shall always like to hear that you are in good health and that you are happy i have to tell you of a very strange thing that happened to us at the mouth of the obion river when we were in the canoe at night time for we travelled all that night we heard some one shouting to us and oh sir it was so like your voice that i trembled when i heard it for it appeared as if it came down out of the clouds it was a thick mist and we could see no one but for all that i would have cried out but father would not let me speak it appeared to be right above our heads and father said it was some woodcutters who had climbed into a tree i suppose that must have been it but it was as like your voice as if it had been you that shouted and as i knew you could not be there it made me wonder all the more we arrived at this place yesterday it is a large town on the arkansas river and we came to it in a steamboat from here we are to travel in a wagon with a great many other people in what they call a caravan and they say we shall be many months in getting to the end of the journey it is a long time to wait before i can write again for there are no towns beyond van buren and no post to carry a letter but though i cannot write to you i will not forget to think of the words you said to me as i am now thinking of them every minute in one of my mother's books which i brought with me i have read a pretty piece it is in poetry and it is so like what i have been thinking of you that i have learnt it off by heart it is so true-like and so pretty a piece that i thought you might like to read it and hoping it would please you i write it at the end of my letter which i fear i have already made too long but i hope you will have patience to read it all and then read the poetry i think of thee when morning springs from sleep with plumage bathed in dew and like a young bird lifts her wings of gladness on the welkin blue and when at noon the breath of love o'er flower and stream is wandering free and sent in music from the grove i think of thee i think of thee i think of thee when soft and wide the evening spreads her robe of light and like a young and timid bride sits blushing in the arms of night and when the moon's sweetest crescent springs in light o'er heaven's deep waveless sea and stars are forth like blessed things i think of thee i think of thee oh sir it is very very true i do think of you and i am sure i shall do so as long as i live lillian holt oh lillian i too think of thee in thy sweet song simple but suggestive words knew i but where to address thee you should know how responsive to them are the echoes of my heart end of chapter thirty nine Chapter 40 of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wild 
Huntress by Main Reed. Chapter 40 The Caravan. We rode on to Memphis as rapidly as our horses could travel, far too slow for our desires. Thence a steamboat carried us to Little Rock and another to Van Buren. Many days had been consumed while waiting for each boat, so many that on arriving at Van Buren we found that the caravan had a start of us by full two weeks. Its probable route we ascertained without any difficulty up along the Arkansas to the Rocky Mountains, through the valley of Hurfano, in the passes Robidu and Quechitopa, thence across the headwaters of the Colorado, and by the old Spanish trail to California. It was principally a caravan of gold seekers, adventurers of all nations, even Indians had gone with it of the half civilized tribes of the frontier red and white equally tempted by the yellow attractions spread out for them in california though large it was what is termed a light train having more pack animals than wagons on this account it would make way all the faster and unless delayed by some accident we might be a long time in coming up with it it was not without a large measure of vexation that we learned how far it had got the start of us i should have submitted with less resignation to the necessary delays but that my mind had been to some extent tranquilized by the contents of Lillian's letter. They had inclined me to the belief that the emigrants were simply en route for California, as was all the world just then, and that the Mormon was, after all, not so strong in his new faith as to resist the universal golden lure. His design in taking the squatter with him might be merely of a secular character, having for its object the securing of a partner, in whose brawny arms the washpan and rocker might be handled to advantage, that they whom we sought were gone with the caravan, we were soon satisfied. Holt was too marked a man to have escaped observation even in a crowd of rough squatters like himself but more than one eye had rested upon his fair daughter that longed to look upon her again her traces were easily told as testified by the answers to my shy inquiries like some bright meteor whose track across the heavens remains marked by its line of luminous phosphorescence her radiant beauty was remembered i needed not to inquire of her scarcely a coterie of which she was not the subject of conversation to my infinite jealousy and chagrin not that aught was said of her that should have given rise to such feelings they were but the offspring of love's selfishness not long had i to submit to such torture our stay in van buren was of the shortest in less than twenty hours after our arrival in the village we took our departure from it turning our faces towards the almost limitless wilderness of the west i had endeavoured to add to our company but without success the caravan had cleared van buren of its unemployed population and not an idler remained 
at least not one who felt inclined to adventure with us even the needy loafer could not be induced to try the trip deeming ours too dangerous an expedition to say the least it was reckless enough but impelled by motives far more powerful than the thirst of gold my comrade and i entered upon our journey with scarce a thought about its perils the only addition to our company was a brace of stout pack mules that carried our provisions and other impedimenta while the old horse of the hunter had been replaced by a more promising roadster it would be idle to detail the incidents of a journey across the prairies ours differed in no way from hundreds of others that had been made and described except perhaps that after reaching the buffalo range we travelled more by night than by day we adopted this precaution simply to save our scalps and along with them our lives since the buffalo range especially upon the arkansas is peculiarly the stamping ground of the hostile savage here may be encountered the pawnee and comanche the kiowa and cheyenne the waco and fierce arapaho though continually engaged in internecine strife among themselves all six tribes are equally enemies to the pale-faced intruders on their domain at this time they were said to be especially hostile have been irritated by some late encounters with parties of ill-behaved emigrants it was not without great peril therefore that we were passing through their territory and what we had heard before leaving van buren had made us fully conscious of the risk we were running to meet with one of the hunting or war parties of these indians might not be certain death but certain they would be to disarm and dismount us and that in the midst of the great prairie ocean is a danger that often conducts to the same denouement it was not preference then but precaution that led us to adopt the secret system of travelling by night our usual plan was to lie by during the day or for the greater part of it concealed in some selected cover either among rocks or copsewood by stealing to a conspicuous eminence we were enabled to view the route ahead of us and map out our journey for the night upon this we would enter an hour or two before sundown for then the indian hunter has returned to his encampment which can be easily avoided by seeing its smoke from afar we often saw their smokes in more than once the indians themselves but were never seen by them so cautiously did we carry out our measures in this fashion we groped our way with considerable rapidity guided by the wagon tracks especially when there was a moon we could travel almost as fast as by daylight only upon dark nights was our progress retarded but notwithstanding every impediment we were enabled to travel faster than the caravan and we knew that we were rapidly gaining upon it we could tell this by the constantly freshening trail but we had a more accurate criterion in the count of the camps by the number of these we knew to a certainty that we were approaching the caravan 
we were in high hopes of being able to come up with it before it should enter the mountain passes more dangerous to the traveller than even the plains themselves because at that season more beset by bands of marauding savages under the influence of these hopes we were pressing forward with all the haste it was in our power to make when our journey was varied by an incident of a somewhat unexpected character End of chapter 40chapter forty one of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the wild huntress by main reed chapter forty one an unprairie like apparition the incident referred to occurred high up the arkansas at the celebrated grove known as the big timbers we had started about two hours before sundown and were riding in a due westerly direction over a rolling prairie the ridges of which as ill luck would have it ran transversely to our course causing the path to be constantly going upward or downward it was not this that troubled us but the fact that as we crested each swell we were freshly exposed to observation from a distance and this recurring so often kept us continuously on the alert once or twice we thought of halting again till after the sun had gone down for we knew that we were treading upon dangerous ground but failing to perceive any fresh indian sign we gave way to our irresolution and continued on we proceeded with caution however always ascending in stealthy silence and peeping carefully over the ridges before crossing them after reconnoitering the intervening valleys we would ride rapidly across to make up the time we had lost in our reconnaissance in this way we travelled some eight or ten miles until the sun was so far down that his lower limb rested on the horizon we were ascending a ridge and had got our eyes on a level with its crest when upon the face of another ridge about a half a mile further on we beheld two forms outlined against the declivity we saw that they were human forms and that they were indians was our first thought but a moment's observation convinced us we were in error they were afoot indians would have been on a horseback there were no floating drapery about their bodies indians would have had something of this sort besides there were other circumstances observable in their figures and movements that negatived the supposition of their being redskins they were singularly disproportioned in size one appearing at least a foot the taller while the shorter man had twice this advantage in girth 
what in old Nick's name can they be? inquired my companion, though only in soliloquy, for he saw that I was as much puzzled as himself. Can you make him out with a glass, Captain? I chanced to have a small pocket telescope. Adopting the suggestion, I drew it forth and leveled it. In another instant, I had within its field of vision a tableau that astonished me. The figures composing it were but two, a very tall man and a very short one. Both were dressed in roundabout jackets and trousers. One, the shorter, had a little dark cap upon his head, while the height of the taller man was increased full ten inches by what appeared to be a black silk or beaver hat. The cut of their respective costumes was nearly the same, but the color was entirely different, the tall personage being all over of a bottle green tint, while his shorter companion shone more conspicuously in sky blue, notwithstanding their vivid colors. Neither costume had anything Indian about it, nor was it like any other sort of rig that one might expect to encounter upon the prairies. What fashion it was did not occur to me at the moment, for the sun, glancing upon the object glass of the telescope, hindered me from having a fair view. Moreover, my attention was less directed to the dress of the man than to their movements. The backs of both were towards us, and they were going forward in the same direction as ourselves. The tall man was in the lead, carrying what appeared to be two guns, one over his left shoulder and another in his right hand. He was advancing in slow, regular strides, his thin body slightly stooped forward, and his long neck craned out in front of him, as if trying to look over the ridge, whose crest he was just approaching. The short man was some half-dozen paces in the rear, and moving in fashion altogether different. His body was bent against the hill, at an angle of less than forty-five degrees with the horizon, and his short, stout legs were playing in rapid steps, as if keeping time to a treadmill, he appeared to be pushing something before him, but what it was I could not guess, since it was completely covered by the disk of his body, spread broadly against the hill. It was not till he had reached the summit and made a slight turn along the ridge that I saw what this object was the exclamation of ludicrous surprise that escaped my companion told me that he also had made it out good gosh captain cried he look yander consign my skin if it ain't a wheelbarrow a wheelbarrow it certainly was for the two men were now traversing along the top of the ridge, and their bodies from head to foot were conspicuously outlined against the sky. There was no mistaking the character of the object in the hands of the shorter individual. A barrel beyond the shadow of a doubt, trundle and trams, box, body, and spoke will complete. The sight of this homely object in the midst of the savage prairies was as ludicrous as unexpected. 
and we might have hailed it with roars of laughter had prudence permitted such an indecorous exhibition as it was my companion chuckled so loudly that i was compelled to caution him whether my caution came too late and that the laughter was heard we could not tell but at that moment the tall pedestrian looked back and we saw that he had discovered us making a rapid sign to his companion he bounded off like a startled deer and after a plunge or two disappeared behind the ridge followed in a full run by the man with the wheelbarrow one might have supposed the flight would have led to the abandonment of the barrow but no it was taken along hurried out of our sight in an instant and in the next both man and machine disappeared as suddenly as if some trap had admitted them into the bowels of the earth the singular fashion of their flight the long strides taken by the gander-like leader and the scrambling attempt at escape made by the barrow man produced a most comic effect i was no longer able to restrain myself but joined my companion in loud and repeated peals of laughter in this merry mood and without any apprehension of danger we advanced towards the spot where the odd figures had been seen some broken ground delayed us and as half a mile of it had to be passed over we were a considerable time in reaching the summit of the hill on arriving there and looking over the swell behind which they had disappeared neither tall nor short man was to be seen a timbered valley lay beyond into this they had evidently escaped the track of the wheelbarrow where it had pressed down the grass alone indicated their recent presence upon the spot as it did also the direction they had taken their retreating from us was easily accounted for they could have seen only the tops of our heads and had no doubt taken us for Indians. End of chapter 41、Chapter、42 of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter 42 A Foot of Thirteen Inches. The presence of the wheelbarrow explained a point that had been puzzling us for some days. We had fallen upon its track more than once, and supposed it to have been made by the wheel of a cart, but in no instance being able to find the corresponding one had given it up as a hopeless enigma. The only explanation we had succeeded in offering ourselves was that some light cart had accompanied the caravan, the load of which, being badly balanced, had thrown the weight upon one wheel, allowing the other to pass over the ground without making an impression. As it was only on dry grass we had traced it, this explanation had sufficed, though far from being satisfactory. Neither my companion nor myself ever thought of a wheelbarrow. Who would in such a place? in the name of old nick who can they be asked wingrove as we halted on the ridge where the fugitives had been last seen i'm not without my suspicions i replied just then thinking of a peculiarity that had but slightly occupied my attention the cut and colour of their dresses if i'm not mistaken the two shy birds that have fled from us are a brace of uncle sam's eagles soldiers in all probability and old soldiers at that but what a soldiers be a doin out higher travelin to california like ourselves desarters may be just what i suspect no doubt the pair have slipped off from some of the frontier posts and having no opportunity to provide themselves with a better means of transport 
have brought the wheelbarrow with them it is ludicrous enough but by no means improbable there are some queer customers in the service of uncle sam i think there be <laughs> what shall we do captain hadn't we better catch up to em that comrade may be easier said than done if they're deserters and they must be if they're soldiers at all they'll take precious good care not to let any one come near them if they can help it the escort that accompanies the train will account for their not being alone with it if they've caught a glimpse of my buttons they'll be cached by this time they only see our heads i reckon they took us for engines in that case they'll hide from us all the same only a little more cunningly consarn their soldier skins if they were as cunning as a couple of possums they can't hide the track of the bearer and so long as they keep in the timber i calculate i'm kin lift their trail i reckon i hain't quite forgot how though i am bamfoozled a bit by these higher prairies consarn them ah dem woods cappin it dis one good a look at em the eyes of the young hunter sparkled with enthusiasm as he spoke it was a real forest that was before us a large tract covered with giant cottonwood trees and the only thing deserving the name of forest we had seen for many days as my companion stood gazing upon it i could trace upon his countenance a joyous expression that rarely appeared there the sight of the big timbers recalled to him the forests of his own tennessee with happy memories of other times they were not unmingled with shadows of regret as i could tell by the change that came stealing over his features we must try to overtake them said i without answering to the ebullition it is important for us to come up with them even if they be deserters they are white men and all whites are friends here they muster two guns and if these fellows are what i take them to be they know how to handle them we must follow them there's no time to be lost you're right there cap'n the night's comin down fast it's already gettin dark and i'm afeard it'd be a tough trekkin under the timber if we're to catch up wouldn the night we hain't a minute to spare let us forward then crossing the ridge we descended rapidly on the other side the track of the wheel guiding us in a direct line to the nearest point of the woods we could tell that the barrel had been trundled down the hill at top speed by the manner in which the iron tire had abraded the surface of the slope we had no difficulty in following the trace as far as the edge of the timber and for some distance into it but there to our great surprise the wheel track abruptly ended it was not that we had lost it by its having passed over dry or rocky ground on the contrary around the spot where it so suddenly disappeared the surface was comparatively soft and even an empty barrel would have made an impression sufficiently traceable either by my companion or myself after beating about for some time and extending our circle to the distance of a hundred yards or so we failed to recover the sign certainly the barrow had not gone farther at all events not upon its trundle instinctively we turned our eyes upward not with any superstitious belief that the fugitives had made a sudden ascent into the air but the idea had occurred to us that they might have hidden themselves in a tree and drawn the barrow up into it a single glance was sufficient to satisfy us that this conjecture was erroneous the thin foliage of the cottonwoods offered no cover a squirrel could hardly have concealed itself among their branches i've got it exclaimed the hunter once more seeking along the surface hires their tracks though there ain't no signs of the bearer i see how they blinded us by gosh they're a couple of cunning old coons whomsoever they may be how have they managed it took up the machine on their shoulders and toted it that away see there's their own tracks they've gone out higher atween these two trees right comrade that appears to be the way they've done it sure enough there is the direction they have taken well if i wa'n't bothered with these higher animals i'd a kid followed them tracks easy enough we'd soon come upon the wheel again i reckon they ain't a goin to travel fur with a hump like that on their shoulders no it's not likely well then cap'n suppose we leave our critters a hair and take arter after them afoot we can quarter the ground a good bit ahead and i guess we'll either come on them or their barrow for long i agreed to this proposal and after securing our four quadrupeds to trees we started off into the depth of the woods only for a short distance were we able to make out the footsteps of the men for they had chosen the dry sward to walk upon in one place where the path was bare of grass their tracks were distinctly outlined and a minute examination of them assured me of the correctness of my conjecture that we were trailing a brace of runaways from a military post 
there was no mistaking the print of the regulation shoe its shape was impressed upon my memory as plainly as in the earth before my eyes and it required no quartermaster to recognize the low ill-rounded heel and flat pegged soles i identified them at a glance and saw moreover that the feet of both the fugitives were encased in the same cheap chaussure only in size did the tracks differ and in this so widely that the smaller was little more than two-thirds the length of the larger one the latter was remarkable for size not so much in its breadth as length which last was not less than thirteen standard inches on noting this peculiarity my companion uttered an exclamation of astonishment there's a foot and no mistake cried he i reckon twere long legs as made them tracks well if i hadn't seed the man himself i'd a swore there were giants in these parts i made no reply though far more astonished than he my astonishment sprang from a different source and was mixed up in my mind with some old memories i remembered the foot end of chapter forty two chapter forty three of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter forty three tracking the trundle yes i had seen that foot before or one so very like it that the resemblance was cheating me this could hardly be with the exception of its fellow the foot of which i was thinking could have no counterpart on the prairies it must be the same at first my recollections of it were but vague i remembered the foot associated with some ludicrous incidents but what they were or when and where they had occurred i could not say certainly i had seen it somewhere but where no matter the foot recalled no unpleasant associations i felt satisfied it was a friendly one and was now more anxious than ever of overtaking its sesquipedalian owner after proceeding a short distance the shoe tracks again became too indistinct to be followed farther by quartering however we came upon them once more at a place where the impressions were deep and clearly defined once more the immense foot rose upon the retina of my memory this time more vividly this time enabling me to place it for i now remembered many an odd incident that had secured it a corner on the page of my recollections sticking through a stirrup with an enormous mexican spur on its heel its owner mounted on a horse thin and raw-boned as himself i remembered the foot as well as the limbs and body to which it was attached beyond a doubt the tall fugitive we were following was an old fellow campaigner a veteran of the rifle rangers the figure as seen through the telescope confirmed me in the belief the long limbs arms and neck the thin angular body all were characteristics of the bodily architecture of jephthah bigelow I no longer doubted that the taller of the two men was my old follower, Jeff Bigelow, or Sure Shot, as his ranger comrades had christened him, and appropriate was the designation, for a Sure Shot than Jeff never looked through the hindsights of a rifle. Who the little man might turn out to be I could not guess, though I was not without some recollections of a figure resembling his. I remembered a certain Patrick, who was also a membered corpse and whose build bore a close resemblance to that of him seen between the trams of the barrow my conjecture as to who the men were increased my desire to overtake them if the tall man should turn out to be sure shot a rifle would be added to our strength worth a dozen ordinary guns and considering the risk we were running in danger of losing our scalps every hour in the day it was of no small importance that we should join company with the deserters we made every exertion therefore to come up with them my comrade employing all the lore of the backwoods in his effort to recover their traces the new footmarks we had discovered though lost the instant after had served one good purpose they indicated the general direction which the two men had followed and this was an important point to be ascertained we found another index in the trees these in most places stood thickly together and it was only here and there an object of such breadth as a wheelbarrow could pass conveniently between their trunks carried upon the shoulders it would be an awkward load with which to squeeze through any tight place and it was reasonable to conclude that only the more open aisles of the forest would be followed this enabled us to make pretty sure of the route taken and after trusting to such guidance for several hundred yards we had the satisfaction to light once more upon the shoe tracks again only a short distance were we able to follow them but they confirmed our belief that we were still on the right trail my comrade had suggested that the man who carried the barrow would soon tire a tote in it and this proved to be the case 
on striking into an old buffalo path our eyes were once more gladdened by the sight of the wheel track plainly imprinted in the mud our prospecting was for the time at an end the barrel track continued along the buffalo path and we were able to follow it almost as fast as our legs could carry us even after it had grown too dark for us to see the track of the wheel we were not disconcerted we could follow it by the feel stooping only at intervals to make sure that it was still among our feet in this way we had travelled to the full distance of a mile from the place where our horses had been left when all at once the barrel track gave out the buffalo path continued on but no barrel had passed over it unless carried as before this was improbable however and we were forced to the conclusion that the two men had turned off by some side path we had not observed while looking for this a sound reached our ears that resembled the murmur of a distant waterfall but listening more attentively we could distinguish it in a different intonation we at once moved in the direction whence the noise came and before we had advanced a hundred yards through the thickly standing trees we were aware that what we heard was the sound of human voices another hundred yards brought us within hearing of words at the same time that a luminous reflection cast upwards among the trees indicated that there was a fire at no great distance off the underwood hindered us from seeing the fire but guided by its gleam we continued to advance after making another long reach through the leafy cover we got the fire well under our eyes as well as those who had kindled it we had no conjecture as to whether we had been following the true track or whether it was the two runaway travellers we had treed the point was determined by an object seen standing close to the fire in the full glare of its ruddy light need i say it was the wheelbarrow end of chapter forty three chapter forty four of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter forty four a brace of old soldiers yes it was the wheelbarrow and the u s ordnance branded upon its side and visible under the light of the blazing pile told whence it had come either fort gibson or fort smith was minus a barrel drawn from their stores by no very formal requisition there were the takers of it one on each side of the fire presenting as great a contrast as could well be found in two human beings although of the same species the two individuals were as unlike each other as a tall greyhound to a turnspit both were seated though in different attitudes the little man was squatted that is with legs crossed under him after the fashion of tailors the long legs of his vis-a-vis -vis would scarcely admit of being thus disposed of and his weight was resting altogether upon his hips and heels in this posture the caps of his knees stood up to the level of his shoulders so that his body viewed on profile presented a pretty accurate imitation of the letter n that sort termed by engravers the rustic letter the huge black hat capped one extremity and the long pedal-like feet that rested horizontally on the ground terminated the other completing the alphabetical resemblance a face with a certain mocking monkeyish expression but without any trait of fierceness or ill-nature a nose slightly snub quick scintillating eyes a chin tipped with a little tuft of clay-coloured beard some half-dozen cue-like tangles of bright yellowish hair hanging down behind the hat the hat itself a black silk badly battered such were the salient points of the portrait appearing above the knee-caps of the taller man with the exception of the tile his costume was altogether military to me well known it was the ordinary undress of the mounted rifles a dark green roundabout of coarse cloth with a row of small brass buttons from throat to waist and overalls of the same material in the particular sample before us overalls was rather an inappropriate name the garment so designated scarcely covered the calves of the wearer's legs, though of these there was not much to cover. The jacket appeared equally scant, and between its bottom border and the waistband of the trousers there was an interval of at least six inches. In this interval was seen a shirt of true Isabella color, which also appeared over the breast, the jacket being worn unbuttoned. The frowsy cotton was visible at other places, peeping through various rents both in jacket and trousers a black leather stock concealed the collar of the shirt if there was any and though the stock itself was several inches in depth there were other several inches of naked neck rising above its rim 
coarse woolen socks the cheap contract shoe completed the costume of sure shot for it was he his contrasting comrade was equally in military garb even more so by the additional article of a cloth forage cap his was also an undress uniform but though a very similar cut to the other and resembling it in the quality of the material the color was different it was sky blue turned whitey with wear the buttons of the jacket being of lead the facings of white worsted tape it was a better fit than the green uniform and its wearer had evidently some conceit in the style of it as was evidenced by the jacket being carefully buttoned from waist to throat and the forage cap set jauntily on three hairs the little man was an infantry his horizontal diameter was twice that of his tall companion of the rifles and in the rounded contour of his body not an angle was apparent his garments were quite filled by his body arms and legs so that there was not a wrinkle to be seen anywhere it was a form usually styled dapper his face was also of the rotund shape the features all tolerably regular with the exception of the nose that like the nasal organ of his comrade was nis retrousse the turn-up being infinitely more pronounced the expression was equally indicative of good nature and good fellowship as the apple-like bloom of his cheeks and the ochreous tinge upon the tip of his nose sufficiently testified cheeks lips and chin were beardless with the exception of a thick stubble that had lately sprung up but some well-greased rings of a darkish colour roughing out under the rim of the forage cap showed that the infantry was not insensible to the pride of hair neither in regard to him had i made a mistaken conjecture another old acquaintance and comrade in arms the redoubtable patrick o'tigg a true son of the sad the two worthies when first seen were seated as described both engaged in a very similar occupation cooking it was by the most simple process that of the roti each held in his hand a long sapling upon the end of which a piece of red meat was impaled and this projected over the fire was fast blackening in the blaze more of the same meat buffalo beef it appeared was seen in the wheelbarrow its other freight being one or two greasy bags a brace of knapsacks a cartouche box and belt two ordnance spades with the guns a regulation rifle and musket lying across the top of the load it was evident from this collection that the men were deserters that they had armed and equipped themselves at the expense of the quartermaster perhaps the paymaster had been in arrears with them and they had adopted this ready and effectual method of wiping out the score my only wonder was at not seeing a brace of branded horses along with them but in all probability on the day or night of their departure the stable sentry had been doing his duty on becoming assured of the identity of the two individuals my first impulse was to step forward to the fire and make myself known to them so eagerly were both engaged in attending to their spits that they had neither seen nor heard us although they themselves were now silent and we were within less than twenty feet of them the intervening bushes however would have sheltered us from their sight even if they had been a little more vigilant as i should have expected sure shot to have been they were trusting all to the thicket in which they had pitched their camp and being hungry and wearied no doubt were for the moment off their guard some fantasy decided me not to disturb them for a moment a sort of curiosity to hear what they would say and if possible discover their whence and whither we were perfectly within earshot and could have heard even a whisper passing from their lips as we could also note the expression upon their faces a sign to my companion was sufficient and crouching behind the leafy screen we awaited the continuation of the suspended dialogue End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 45 The Barrow in Debate our patience was not put to a severe test otig was not the man to keep his tongue in tranquillity for any extended time neither was sure shot an admirer of the silent system both were talkers on this occasion the infantry was the first to make himself heard be japers comrade i'm after a thinking foot purty fools us have been to take it afoot this way like two tramps when we's might every bit as will have been stroyed in a pair of good ponies we could a fitched a pair from the fort with all the eyes in the world 
ye's bitterick certain ye ain't first try about that particular we've been rather ungumptious besides we's right as will have been hung for a sheep as a lamb we'll be flogged all as one i've the escort finds us for taking the guns on the knapsack and the whale borough bad luck to the borough no petrick don't cuss the barra it has served us for certain we couldn't a got along thout the machine how kid we we could never have toted our doins yes we've did and but for the piece of bacon and that ere bag o meal we'd have starved long afore this i reckon don't cuss the barra och it's made my shoulders ache as if some scoundrel had been a beatin them with a sprig o shillily ne'er a mind about that your shoulders will be all right arter you got a wink o sleep spank my skin if that air won't a cute dodge it's drove the endins off the scent for certain or we'd a heard something o them vermin afore this faith i think we've succeeded in bamboozling them sure enough the meat by this time showed sufficiently done and the two men applied themselves to eatin with an earnestness that allowed no time for talking the conversation had revealed enough of their past actions and future designs to confirm conjectures i had already formed about them as stated they had both belonged to the rangers of immortal memory after the disbandment of the corps they had entered upon a fresh lease of soldier life by enlisting into the regular army otig had given preference to the sky blue of the line while the yankee had taken to the mounted rifles as a capital marksman like him would naturally do indeed it would have been impossible to have licked the latter into anything like soldierly shape and all the drill sergeants in creation could not have made him stand with toes turned in or eyes right to have dressed the old ranger in line would have been a physical impossibility in the mounted rifles personal appearance is of less importance and considering the little inclination there is to enlist in the american army especially in times of peace the oddest-looking article is thankfully accepted in the dearth of recruits sure shot could have had no difficulty in passing inspection both had evidently become tired of their respective services the routine of a frontier post is of itself sufficient to produce the deadliest ennui and the californian attraction had capped the climax the temptation was too strong for either yankee or hibernian nature to resist and these worthy types of both had taken french leave of the fort it was thus that i epitomized the recent history of my old comrados as they were evidently aware of the caravan being in the advance and had been following it it was easily conjectured that fort smith a military post on the arkansas opposite van buren had been the scene of their defection very likely they had kept near the train all along the route with a view to guidance and partial protection as also for a dunier resort to which they might betake themselves in case of their stores giving out the escort hinted at would be sufficient to account for their not being in closer communication with the caravan it appeared they had been so far fortunate in escaping an encounter with indians but this as in our case was most likely due to the passage of the caravan we knew that the red-skinned robbers would be too much occupied with the train itself and its more immediate stragglers to be looking out for any so far in the rear as we and to this circumstance no doubt we were indebted for the uninterrupted travel we had achieved a greater proximity to the train would have rendered our passage more perilous sure shot though a slouch in his dress was no simpleton the trick of taking up the barrel was no doubt a conception of his brain as well as its being borne upon the shoulders of the irishman who in all likelihood had performed the role of wheeling it from fort smith to the big timbers and was expected to push it before him to the edge of the pacific ocean it was evident that patrick was tired of his task for they had not made much progress in the homeric supper before he once more returned to the subject but sure now comrade we might manage without a bore a scene as we've got into the buffalo's country aren't them bastes as aisy to kill as tame cows sure we'd never be without meat as long as our powder lasts just to utter we you fool we're a goin out o the buffler country and into perch where there ain't any animal bigger than a rat on to other side of mountains there ain't no beasts of any kind nary a one and it's just there we'll want that ere bag o meal if we don't take it along we'll starve for certain be me soul i'd rather carry the mail on my shoulders there's less of it now and maybe i could manage it if you'd only carry the spids and dim other things we might lave the knapsacks and cartridge box behind 
what you should they be in california they'd only lead our detection by the troops out there don't ee be skirt bout thit kimrad if there's troops in california they'll hev dear hands full ithout travellin us i reckon we ain't like to be the only two critters as hasn't got a pass for the dickens near a bit it we'll find deserters out there as thick as blue bottles on a barkus certainly we shall besides petrick we needn't take the knapsacks all the way out there nor the baron neither nor nothing else we brought from the fort for what div yous mean interrogated the irishman evidently puzzled to interpret the other's speech we can leave all dem fiction in mornin city but will the train be after thravellin that way sure you don't know that certain it will a putty considerable part i it air made up a mornin's and they'll be bound to the salt lake we can follow them and drop t'other in the mormon settlements we can swap our uniforms for suthin else and the barra too he stood an m six and cartridge box i guess is how i intend to make a speck on them ere two articles for what a pair of soger knapsacks in an old cartridge box they wouldn't fish the worth o drinks a pace you're your mistaking mr tigg perhaps they'll swap better than you think how do you know i ain't like to git a beast a piece for em either a mule or a hoss this child ain't a goin to foot all the way to Californy beyond the mormon city he rides a spell i reckon pay-japers that's a out and out good idea but how div ye mean to carry it through whoa that's what bothers patrick o tig weel patrick i'll tell ee my plan i ain't got it straightened out yet but i hope to have it all right by the time we're on t'other side of the mountains leastwise before we reaches mormon city hurrah for what is it inquired the impatient irishman the yankee did not vouchsafe an immediate answer but while polishing off the bone he held in his hand appeared at the same time to be busy with some mental operation perhaps straightening out the plan he had promised to reveal End of chapter forty five chapter forty six of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter forty six a tough story for some seconds the two worthies observed a mutual silence broken only by a formidable rattle of teeth as large chunks of buffalo meat were put through their respective masticating machines curious to hear the promised revelation wingrove and i checked our impatience and clung to our covert among the bushes one thing to which their speech had incidentally adverted was not without much significance and had produced upon me a certain impression that was unpleasant they appeared to know or sure shot did that at least a portion of the train was en route for the mormon city it is true i had originally suspicions of this but the letter of lillian had led me to hope it might be otherwise any destination but that i had commenced reflecting upon this point when i was interrupted by the voice of sure shot resuming the conversation thus did he enter on his explanation you see came red these moorings yes i've here an air mighty taken up with sogrin and that sort of thing you've heard talk of your great battalion they'll be arter these er trippins for certain since they hain't much chance of gettin soger fixins out there well what i mean to do is to put the nip six off on em for some new improvement of pattern i guess it air that i've heard say so at the fort then the mormon general who air the prophet hisself and who's got barrels of dollars he'll buy the nip six at any price now do you take mr kick troth i do but div you think yous can fool them so i see easy as eatin punk of pie jehoshaphat i ain't been five year in the trading line without learn a business i reckon be me faith yous must have been rale cliver at it when you sold them cypress knees for bacon hams to the baltimoreans you remember that story yous told us down mexico yes certainly i remember it <laughs> but i came a better trick than that on the orleans people about five years ago just fore i gin the rangers 
for who was it sir weedle you see i want allers as poor as i'm now i had a partnership in a bit of a schooner as used to trade between boston and orleans and we used to load her with all sorts of notions to sell to the orleans folk ye hoshaphat and pork pies they air fools and no mistake and creole french we could have sold em wooden nutmegs and brick dust for cayenne pepper and such like and i bout guess is how we did speculate a little in that line of business well there came a time when they took a notion they could make a cheap brogan as they call em like alligators of leather and supply the whole nigger market with em the nails were there and so they took to using boot pegs but not having a manufactory of pegs down south they had to get em from the north just then my partner and i thought of making a speculation on the pegs so we loaded our schooner with that air freight chuck right up to the hatches and then sot off from boston for orleans we thought we'd make durn fortune out that ere trip sure yes did didn't ye no near a bit it it came nigh breaking us a raw how well you see when we got around to orleans we learnt that the boot trade had almost stopped the alligator leather didn't turn out just the thing for brogans and besides it got a scase by reason o the killin them vermin in course the pegs head fell in price they'd came down so low that we could only get twenty-five cents a bushel for mother moses only twenty-five cents a bushel that was all they'd fetch or from when and where we would in course we want fools enough to take that the dern nation pigs had cost us more in boston devil it out of it but what did you do with me how we you mr tigg we were clear beat at first and didn't know what to do neither mare my partner but arter taking a good think over it i see the way of getting out of the scrape leastwise it's out such a loss as selling the pigs at twenty-five cents a bushel i see the chance of getting rid of them at fifty cents all right now in what way comrade you've seen boot pegs i reckon mr tigg i'm sure i if aren't they the same but's in these subtler sprogues we got on bad luck to em jis the same only whitier when they are new be japers i think i remember seeing a barrel full of them in new york very certain it were them they are usually packed in barrels can you think of anything they look like well in troth they look more like oats than any i can recollect sure they did look mighty like oats and don't e calculate they'd a looked more like oats if and they'd been pointed at both ends instead of one in troth would they all the same well that's the very idea them came into my mind at the time hurrah now is it and for what did you do with the pigs then just sharpen the rings of em and sold em for oats the puzzled half incredulous stare on the countenance of the hibernian was ridiculous in the extreme the allegation of the yankee had deprived him of speech and for some moments he sat gazing at the latter evidently in doubt whether to give credence to the story or reject it as a little bit of a sell upon the part of his comrade with whose eccentricity of character he was well acquainted equally ludicrous was the look of gravity on the countenance of the other which he continued to preserve under the continued gaze of his comrade with all the solemnity of a judge upon the bench it was as much as my companion and i could do to restrain our laughter but we were desirous of witnessing the finale of the affair and by an effort succeeded in holding in hawk now mr sure shot gasped the irishman at length can it's only joking here to i tell you patrick every word it you see the oats were just selling at fifty cents a bushel and that paid us we made a little suthin too by the speculation but how did you get the other ins pointed at all at all oh that were easy enough i invented a machine for that and run em too in less than no time when they came out to other end o the machine i kidn't myself i told em from oats ah now i comprehend ah rah, ah and one in a queer trick be my soul it beats banneker all the bases ha 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 wingrove and i could hold in no longer 
but joining in the loud cachinnation as if we had been its echoes sprang forward to the front infantry and riflemen bounded to their feet with the simultaneous shout of indians and dropping their spits and half-eaten apolas of meat dashed into the bushes like a pair of frightened rabbits in an instant both were out of sight and their whereabouts was alone indicated by the rattling of the branches as they passed through them i was apprehensive of losing them altogether and regretted not having used more caution in approaching them at that crisis an idea came to my aid and giving out an old signal well remembered by the ci devant rangers i had the gratification of receiving a double response the utterance of the signal had brought them to an instantaneous halt and i could hear them exchanging surmises and exclamations of astonishment as they retraced their steps toward the fire presently a pair of short snub-nosed faces were seen peering through the leaves while from the lips of their owners burst simultaneously the captain the captain with various other phrases in their respective patois expressive of surprise and recognition a few words sufficed to explain all as we had surmised the men were deserters neither attempted to deny what in time of peace is not considered a very heinous crime and for which just then the californian fever was considered an ample justification it was no affair of ours i was only too rejoiced to join the company with the runaways of whose loyalty to myself i had proofs of old their guns more especially the rifle of sure shot would be a valuable addition to our strength and instead of crawling along under cover of night we might now advance with more freedom and rapidity it was determined therefore to share our means of transport with our new comrades an offer by them eagerly and readily accepted the partial consumption of our stores had lightened the packs upon our mules and the contents of the wheelbarrow equally divided between them would give to each only its ordinary load the barrow itself was abandoned left among the big timbers to puzzle at a future period some red-skinned archaeologist cheyenne or a rapaho end of chapter forty six Chapter forty seven of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter forty seven. The Mountain Parks. We now proceeded along the route with more confidence, though still acknowledging the necessity of caution and always reconnoitring the ground in advance although the four of us might have defended ourselves against four times our number of indian enemies we were passing through a part of the country where if indians were to be met at all it would be in large bands or war parties the arkansas heads in that peculiar section of the rocky mountain chain known as the parks a region of country celebrated from the earliest times of fur trading and trapping the arena of a great number of adventures of personal encounters and hair-breadth escapes than perhaps any other spot of equal extent upon the surface of the globe here the great cordillera spread out into numerous distinct branches or sierras over which tower those noted landmarks of the prairie traveller pikes and longs peaks and the watoya or cumbre espanolas projected far above their fellows and rising thousands of feet into the region of eternal snow between their bases embosomed amid the most rugged surrounding of bare rocky cliffs or dark forest-clad declivities lie valleys smiling in the soft verdure of perpetual spring watered by crystal streams sheltered from storms and sequestered from all the world the most noted of these are the old and new parks in the bayou salade because these are the largest but there are hundreds of smaller ones not nameless but known only to those adventurous men the trappers who for half a century have dwelt in this paradise of their perilous profession since here is the habitat of the masonic beaver its favorite building ground over these valley plains roam gangs of the gigantic buffalo while in the openings between their copses may be descried the elk antelope and black-tailed deer browsing in countless herds on the cliffs that overhang them the noble form of the carnero cimarron ovis montana or bighorn of the hunters may be seen in bold outline against the sky and crawling through the rocky ravines as encountered the grizzly bear the most fierce and formidable of american carnivora the red cougar and brown wolverine crouch along the edges of the thicket to contest with jackal and wolf in the possession of the carcass 
where some stray quadruped has fallen a victim to the hungry troop while black vultures wheeling aloft await the issue of the conflict birds of fairer fame add animation to the scene the magnificent milagres shining in metallic lustre with spread wings and tail offers a tempting aim to the hunter's rifle as it promises to afford him a rich repast in the coq de prairie and its gigantic cogener the sage grouse whirr up at intervals along the path the waters have their denizens in grey canada and white fronted geese ducks of numerous species the stupid pelican and shy loon gulls cormorants and the noble swan while the groves of alamo ring with the music of numerous bright-winged songsters scarcely known to the ornithologist but no land of peace is this fair region of the rocky mountains there are parks but no palaces there are fertile fields but none to till them for it is even dangerous to traverse them in the open light of day the trapper skulks silently along the creek scarcely trusting himself to whisper to his companion and watching warily as he renews the bait of castorium the hunter glides with stealthy tread from copse to copse dreading the echo of his own rifle even the red-skinned rover goes not here alone but only with a large band of his kindred a hunting or a war party the ground is neutral as it is hostile claimed by many tribes and owned by none all enter it to hunt or make war but none to settle or colonize from every quarter of the compass come the warrior and hunter and of almost as many tribes as there are points upon the card from the north the crow and sioux from the south the kiowa the comanche the yicarela apache and even at times the tame tausa from the east penetrate the cheyenne the pawnee the arapaho while through the western gates of this hunter's paradise pour the warlike bands of the utah and the shoshone all these tribes are in mutual enmity or amity among themselves of greater or less strength but between some of them exists a hostility of the deadliest character such are the vendettas between crow and shoshone pawnee and comanche utah and arapaho some of the tribe have the repute of being friendly to the whites among these may be mentioned the utahs and crows while the more dreaded names are cheyenne kiowa and arapaho the last in hostility to the whites equaling the noted blackfeet farther north in all cases however the amity of the prairie indian is a friendship upon which slight faith can be placed and the trapper even in crow or utah land is accustomed to sleep with one eye open in past times utahs have been more partial to the pale faces than most other tribes of north americans and in their territory many of the celebrated trapper stations or rendezvous are situated at times mutual provocations have led to dire encounters and then are the utahs to be dreaded more perhaps than any other indian in their association with their trapper allies they have learnt how to handle and with skill that most formidable of weapons for partisan warfare the hunter's rifle at the time of which i write the utahs were reported to be on good terms with the whites the mormons had done everything to conciliate them and it was said that a single white man might traverse their territory with perfect safety it was chiefly in the passes that led to the utah's country that danger from indians was to be apprehended in the valleys and ravines above mentioned where cheyennes comanches pawnees and arapahoes were more likely to be met with than the utahs themselves we were not yet certain by which pass the caravan might cross the great cordillera from beyond the big timbers three routes were open to it first with a southern route through the eaton mountains which leads to santa fe in new mexico and is known as the santa fe trail i did not anticipate their taking this one it was not their design on leaving fort smith to pass by santa fe else would they have kept up the canadian by the head of the llano estacado and thence to california by the gila another route parts from the arkansas still higher up by one of its affluents the fondaine cubot this is the cherokee trail which after running north along the eastern slope of the rocky mountains crosses them by the cheyenne pass and on through bridger's pass into the central valley of the great basin neither did i believe that the train would travel by this trail the season of the year was against the supposition in all probability the central route of the three would be the one followed leading from the arkansas up the hirfano river and through robidos pass or that of the sangre de cristo either of these conducts into the valley of the rio del norte thence by the famed cuchitopa or gate of the buffaloes on the headwaters of the western colorado 
this pass though long known to the trappers and ciboleros of new mexico had only just come into notice as a road to the pacific but being one of the most central and direct it had already been tried both by californian and mormon immigrants and found practicable for wagons the caravan had left van buren with the design of taking this road but i knew that the design might be altered by contingencies hence our uncertainty the rocky mountains could be crossed by following up the arkansas to its remotest sources on the southern side of the bayou salad but the stupendous gorges through which that river runs leave no pass practicable for wheeled vehicles only by mounted men or pack mules can the cordillera be crossed at that point and of course it did not occur to us that the caravan we were following would attempt it at three points then might we expect to find its trace parting from the arkansas near bent's old fort for the southern route at the fontaine quibot river for the northern and for the central it should diverge up the valley of the hirofano in any case our risk would be unquestionably great we should have to travel through districts of country where white men and red men meet only as foes where to kill each other at sight is the instinct and practice of both, and where, though it may sound strange to civilized ears, to scalp after killing each other is equally a mutual custom. Such was the character of the region through which we should have to travel. No wonder we were anxious to come up with the caravan before it should have passed through the dangerous gorges of the mountains. Independent of other motives, our personal safety prompted us to hasten on, at first our new comrades were not exactly agreeable to the design of overtaking the train they had the escort in their thoughts and along with it the dread of the nine-tailed cat but a little instruction as to the far greater danger they were in from indians of which up to that hour they had been in happy ignorance reconciled them to our purpose and thenceforward they picked up their feet with a pleasing rapidity both preferred risking the skin of their backs to losing that of their heads but of the former they had now less fear since i had promised to disguise them before bringing them face to face with the troopers of the escort notwithstanding our increased strength we travelled with as much caution as ever for the danger had augmented in proportion we made most way under the friendly shadow of night sometimes by the light of the moon and only by day when we could discover no indian sign in our neighbourhood only two of us could ride at a time the other two taking it afoot but in this way a journey can be made almost as well as when each has a horse to himself our pack animals gave us little trouble as the continued travel had long since trained them to follow in file and without requiring to be led we refrained from making fires where the ground was unfavourable only when we could choose our camp in the midst of a timbered thicket or down in the secluded depth of some rocky ravine did we risk kindling fires and them we extinguished as soon as they had served the purpose of our simple cuisine these precautions drawn from experience were absolutely necessary in a passage across the prairies at least by a party so small as ours perhaps had we continued them we might have escaped a misfortune that soon after befell us and the tale of which is now to be told end of chapter forty seven chapter forty eight of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shafta, Oakland, California. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 48 The Abandoned Bouquet having passed bent's fort a wide celebrity of trapper lord whilom the scene of many wild revel of the mountain men but now abandoned in the ruins we arrived at the confluence of the huerfano as we expected the trace turned up the valley of this latter stream thus deciding the route taken by the caravan we rode on through a forest of grand cottonwoods and willows and at about seven miles distant from the mouth of the huerfano river reached a point where the caravan had crossed over to its left bank on the other side we could see the ground of their encampment of the night before we could tell it by the fresh traces of animals and wagons debris of the morning's repast and half-burnt faggots of the fires that had cooked it 
still sending up their clouds of oozing smoke the stream at this point was fordable and crossing over we stood upon the deserted campground with singular emotions i walked amid the smouldering fires forming conjectures as to which of them might have been graced by that fair presence where had she passed the night and what had occupied her thoughts were those gentle words still lingering in her memory were they upon her lips it was pleasant for me to repeat them i did not need to draw the writing forth long since were the lines fixed in my remembrance oft through my heart had vibrated the burden of that sweet song i think of thee i think of thee my reflections were not altogether unmingled with pain love cannot live without doubts and fears jealousy is an infallible concomitant ever present as the thorn with the rose how could i hope that one hour of my presence had been sufficient to inspire in that young bosom the passion of a life it could scarcely be other than a slight impression a passing admiration of some speech word or gesture too transient to be true perhaps i was already forgotten perhaps only remembered with a smile instead of a sigh though still but a short time since our parting many scenes had since transpired many events had occurred in the life of that young creature to give it experience forms of equal perhaps superior elegance had come before her eye might not one of these had made its image upon her heart the caravan was not a mere conglomeration of coarse rude adventurers there were men of all classes composing it not a few of accomplished education not a few who using a hackneyed phrase were men of the world familiar with its ways and its wiles and who perfectly understood all those intricate attentions and delicate lures by which the virgin heart is approached and captured there were military men too those ever to be dreaded rivals in love young officers of the escort laced booted and spurred bedecked moreover with that mysterious influence which authority ever imparts to its possessor could these be blind to the charms of such a travelling companion impossible or could she her young bosom just expanding to receive the god of love fail to acknowledge the nearest form as his image painfully improbable it was therefore with feelings of no very pleasant kind that i sought around for some souvenir the remains of a fire a little apart from the rest near the edge of a piece of copse wood drew my attention it looked as if it had been a spot on which some family group had encamped i was led to this conjecture by observing some flowers scattered near for the grassy sward showed no other sign the flowers betokened the presence of womankind fair faces or one at least had beamed in the light of that fire i felt morally certain of it i approached the spot the shrubbery around was interlaced with wild roses while blue lupins and scarlet pelargoniums sparkled over the glade under the sheltering protection of the trees by the edge of the shrubbery lay a bouquet that had evidently been put together with some care dismounting i took it up my fingers trembled as i examined it for even in this slight object i read indications of design 
the flowers were of the rarest and prettiest of many kinds that grew not near they had been plucked elsewhere some one had given both time and attention to their collection and arrangement who it would have been idle to shape even a conjecture but for a circumstance that appeared to offer a certain clue and not without bitter thoughts did i try to unwind it the thread which was warped around the flower stalk was of yellow silk the strands were finely twisted and i easily recognized the bullion from the tassel of a sash that thread must have been taken from the sash of a dragoon officer had the bouquet been a gift to whom and by whom here all conjecture should have ended but not without a feeling of painful suspicion did i examine those trivial signs and the feeling continued to annoy me long after i had flung the flowers at my feet a reflection came to my relief which went far toward restoring my spirit's equanimity if a gift and to lillian holt she had scarcely honored it else how could the flowers have been there had they been forgotten or left unregarded there was consolation in either hypothesis and in the trust that one or the other was true i sprang back into my saddle and with a more cheerful heart rode away from the spot End of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter forty nine the unexpected appearance the finding of the flowers or rather the reflections to which they gave rise rendered me more anxious than ever to come up with the caravan the little incident had made me aware of the new danger hitherto unthought of up to that hour my chief anxiety with regard to lillian holt had been the companionship of the mormon this had been heightened by some information incidentally imparted by the deserters chiefly by sure shot it related to the destination of a number of the emigrants who accompanied the caravan and with whom the riflemen had held intercourse previous to their departure from van buren these were not prospective gold diggers but persons migrating westward from motives more spiritual they were saints bound for the salt lake there intending to stay and settle there was a large party of these latter-day converts under the conduct of an apostolic agent this much had sure shot ascertained he had not been their leader nor heard his name joshua stebbins might be the very man even as a conjecture this was bitter enough up to the time of joining with the deserters i had consoled myself with the belief that california was the destination of this saint and his squatter protege though at times i was troubled with the remembrance of suwanee's words their truth was almost confirmed by the report of the ex-rifleman i could not now think otherwise than that stebbins was bound for the mormon city and that he was the fox in charge of the flock of geese that accompanied the emigrant train it was more than probable while waiting in swampville 
for the letter of lillian i had learnt something of the history of the se devant schoolmaster not much of the period subsequent to his departure from that place little more than the fact that he had joined the mormons and had risen to a high office in their church in short that he was one of their apostles this fact however was one of primary significance had the squatter also submitted to the hideous delusion was he also on his way to the shrine of the faith the answer to the former question was of slight importance so long as that to the latter might be conceived in the affirmative if holt was bound to the salt lake then was the fate of his daughter to be dreaded not long there may a virgin dwell the baptism of the new jordan soon initiates its female neophytes into the mysteries of womanhood absolutely compelling them to the marriage tie forcing them to a wedlock loveless and unholy suffering under such apprehensions i scarcely needed the additional stimulus of jealousy to urge me onward and yet strange as it may appear the finding of the bouquet had produced this effect i would have ridden on without halt but our animals required rest we had been travelling nearly all night and throughout the morning under the friendly shelter of the cottonwood forest we all needed an hour or two of repose and seeking a secure place near the ground of the deserted camp we stopped to obtain it the train could not be far ahead of us while seated in silence around the fire we had kindled we could hear at intervals the reports of guns they came from up the valley and from a far distance the sounds reached us but faintly now single shots and then two or three together or following in quick succession we were at no loss to account for the reports they were caused by the hunters of the caravan in pursuit of game we had now entered that charming region where elk and antelope abounded on our morning march we had seen herds of both trooping over the sward almost within range of our rifles even as we sat a band of beautiful antelopes appeared in the open ground near our bivouac fire and after satisfying their curiosity by gazing at us for a moment they trotted off into the covert it was a tempting sight too tempting for the young backwoods hunter to resist seizing his rifle he took after them promising us as he went off a more savoury breakfast than the dry buffalo meat we were broiling soon after we heard the report of his piece and presently he appeared with a dead pronghorn upon his shoulders as wingrove came up to the fire i noticed a singular expression upon his countenance instead of being rejoiced by his success his looks betrayed anxiety i questioned him as to the cause he did not answer directly but drawing me to one side inquired in a whisper if i had seen any one in his absence no why do you ask if it wasn't altogether impossible i swore i seed that girl what girl i trembled as i put the question i was thinking of lillian that darnation devil of a chickasaw what suwanee yes suwanee oh that cannot be it could not be her so i thought myself but darn me cap'n if i can believe it warn't her what i see were as like her as two eggs what did you see well just arter i'd killed the goat and were hoistin on my shoulders 
I spied an engine glidin' into the bushes. I seed it were a squaw, and just the picter of the Chickasaw. She peered as if she had came right out here, and I thought you must a seed her. Did you get a sight of her face? No, her back work torched me, and she kept on without turnin' or stoppin' a minute, twar the very duds that girl used to wear, and her bulk to an inch. It couldn't a been like her, her. Darn me if it twarn't either her or her ghost. It is very improbable that it could have been either. I did not for a moment entertain the idea that it was the Chickasaw he had seen, and yet my comrade was fully impressed with the belief and reiterated the assertion that he had either seen Suwanee or her shatter. Though the thing was improbable, it was not beyond possibility. We knew that there were Indians traveling with the train. We had heard so before starting out. But what likelihood was there of Suwanee being among them? Certainly not much. That there were prairie Indians around us was probable enough. We had already observed their traces upon the ground of the deserted camp. The squaw, seen by Wingrove, might be one of these. Whether or not, her presence proved the proximity of redskins, and the knowledge of having such dangerous neighbors summoned us to a fresh exercise of vigilance and caution. Our fire was instantly extinguished and contenting ourselves with a morsel of the half-broiled buffalo beef we moved to some distance from the spot before proceeding to cook the antelope a dark covert in the thick woods offered us a more secure kitchen there we rekindled our fire and roasting the ribs of the pronghorn refreshed ourselves with an ample meal after an hour's repose we resumed our journey in confident expectation that before sunset we should get within sight of the caravan End of chapter forty nine chapter fifty of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 50 Up the Canyon we had not ridden far from the halting place when we arrived at the end of the great cottonwood forest beyond that the trace led over open grounds here and there dotted by groves and islands of timber through these we threaded our way keeping as much as possible among the trees further on we came upon a gorge one of the noted canyons through which the herfuano runs here the river sweeps down the narrow channel with rocky banks that rise on each side into precipitous cliffs of stupendous height to avoid this gorge impassable for wheeled vehicles the wagon trace below its entrance turns off to the right and we perceived that the caravan had taken that direction to get around the heads of the transverse ravines that run into the canyon a detour must be made of not less than ten miles in length beyond the canyon the trace once more returns to the stream the notes of the military reconnaissance had forewarned me of this deviation and furthermore that the trace passes over a ridge altogether destitute of timber to follow it therefore in the broad light of day would expose our little party to view if hostile indians should be hanging after the caravan they would be sure to see us 
and equally certain to make an attack upon us and from the traces we had noticed at the night camp to say nothing of what wingrove had seen we knew that there were indians in the valley they might not be hostile but the chances were ten to one that they were and under this supposition it would be imprudent in us to risk crossing the ridge before nightfall there were two alternatives to remain under the timber till after sunset and then proceed by night or to push on into the canyon and endeavor to make our way along the bed of the stream so far as we knew the path was an untried one but it might be practicable for horses we were now on the most dangerous ground we had yet trodden the highway of several hostile tribes and their favorite tenting place when going to or returning from their forays against the half civilized settlements of new mexico the proximity of the caravan which we calculated to be about ten miles ahead of us only increased our risk there was but little danger of the indians attacking that the train was too strong even without at the escort but the probability was that a band of indian horse thieves would be skulking on its skirts not to make an attack upon the caravan itself but as wolves after a gang of buffalo to sacrifice the stragglers unless when irritated by some hostile demonstration these robbers confined themselves to plundering but in the case of some murder is the usual concomitant of plunder the delay of another night was disheartening to all of us but especially so to myself for reasons already known if we should succeed in passing through the canyon perhaps on the other side we might come in sight of the caravan cheered on by this prospect we hesitated no longer but hastening forward entered between the jaws of the defile a fearsome chasm it was the rocky walls rising perpendicularly to the height of many hundreds of feet presenting a grim facade on each side of us the sky above appeared a mere strip of blue and we were surrounded by a gloom deeper than that of twilight the torrent roared and foamed at our feet and the trail at times traversed through the water there was a trail as we soon perceived and what was more significant one that had recently been travelled horses had been over it and in several places the rocky pebbles that should otherwise have been dry were wet by the water that had dripped from their fetlocks a large troop of horses must have passed just before us had the dragoon escort gone that way more likely a party of mounted travellers belonging to the train and yet this did not strike us as being likely we were soon convinced that such was not the case on riding forward we came upon a mud deposit at the mouth of one of the transverse ravines over which led the trail the mud exhibited the tracks distinctly and in a more significant light they were hoof tracks we saw that more than a hundred horses had passed up the defile and not one shod animal among them this fact was very significant they could not have been troop horses nor yet those of white men if ridden they must have been ridden by indians it did not follow that they were ridden we were travelling through a region frequented by the mustang droves that had been seen upon our route at great distances off for these are the shyest and wildest 
of all animals a cavalada may have passed through the gorge on their way to the upper valley there was nothing improbable in this although the plains are the favorite habitat of the horse the mustang of spanish america is half a mountain animal and often penetrates the most difficult passes climbing the declivities with hoof as sure as that of a chamois had these horses been ridden that was the point to be determined and how the sign was not very intelligible but sufficiently so for our purpose the little belt of mud deposit was only disturbed by a single line of tracks crossing it directly from side to side the animals had traversed it in single file wild horses would have crowded over it some of them at least kicking out to one side or the other this i myself knew the reasoning appeared conclusive we had no longer a doubt that a large party of indians had gone up the gorge before us and not very long before us it now became a question of advance or retreat to halt within the defile even had a halting place offered would have been perilous above all things there was no spot where we could conceal either ourselves or our animals the mounted indians might be returning down again and finding us in such a snug trap would have us at their mercy we did not think therefore of staying where we were to go back was too discouraging we were already half through the canyon and had ridden over a most difficult path often fording the stream at great risk and climbing over boulders of rock that imperiled the necks both of ourselves and our animals we determined to keep on we were in hopes that the indians had by this time passed clear through the gorge and ridden out into the valley above in that case there would be no great risk in our proceeding to the upper end our expectations did not deceive us we reached the mouth of the chasm without having seen other signs of those who had proceeded us than the tracks of their horses we had heard sounds however that had given us some apprehension the report of guns not as during the early part of the day in single shots but in half dozens at a time and once or twice in large volleys as if of a scattering fusillage the sounds came from the direction of the upper valley and were but faintly heard so faintly that we were in doubt as to whether they were reports of firearms the grumbling and rushing of the river hindered us from hearing them more distinctly but for the presence of indians in the valley about which we were quite certain we should perhaps not have noticed the sounds or else have taken them for something else perhaps we might have conjectured that a gang of buffaloes had passed near the train leading to a brisk emptying of rifles but the presence of indians rendered this hypothesis less probable we still continued to observe caution before emerging from the defile we halted near its entrance wingrove and myself stealing forward to reconnoitre an elevated post which we obtained upon a shelf of the rock gave us a commanding prospect of the upper valley the sight restored our confidence the caravan was in view End of chapter 50